Hello, everyone. Welcome, Julia. Thanks uh, very much for joining us. Uh, I'm Thomas Forjak. Uh, Julia is, uh, is an anti-state activist uh, and a Bitcoin activist. Um, we're going to talk about that uh, in, in a minute, uh, and you'll be able to ask questions. If you, if you want to, um, there's, uh, there's a field right below the video. Just shoot a question. You can upvote any other question you like. We'll pick them up as we go and, uh, and talk about them. Uh, before we start, I'd like to mention one thing. Uh, you've all probably heard about uh, Google blocking um, ads for antiwar.com for some weird reasons. Um, now, bitcoin.bombs.com runs, uh, runs um, a contest related to this for the best uh, anti-war or pro-peace uh, uh, means um, that would, you know, ex expose, uh, expose sort of this, this activity. Um, would be great if you if you join there. Our prizes for it: Roger Beer and Luxtech uh, donated one Bitcoin for the winner, and there are a few other great uh, great prizes like ten ounces of silver and uh, one ounce uh, of, uh, of Bitcoin equivalent silver, and so on. Um, so it's uh, Bitcoin uh, dot Bitcoin not bombs dot com. You can send your submissions to don't expose evil at Bitcoin uh, not bombs dot com. Um, and uh, all the submissions will be published and the winner or a few winners will get uh, one of these great prizes. Um, so, um, welcome again and uh, hi Julia. Hello. So you're an anti-state activist. Uh, could you, um, now we know how, you know, state with its uh, monopoly over, you know, the violence and law enforcement, how it misuses and exploits uh, its position. Uh, we've seen it just recently, a couple of days ago, um, with, uh, with the policeman shooting uh, innocent man or unarmed man in the back. Um, but it is, it is less clear how the state misuses its position over a monopoly of the money and too many people still think this is somehow desired and it gives money the value. Uh, so how do you see this related, the, the monopoly of, of, of the state over money and its ability to, to exploit that position and to infringe on our rights? Uh, well, money is just human interaction with value. So if you control money, then you control human beings. That's simple. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, Eric, who was on the last show, who quoted that uh, famous, famous quote, uh, give me control of nation's money and I, I, I care not who makes its laws. Um, mm -hmm. So what, what activities uh, related to liberty and to Bitcoin uh, are you mostly into? What? Oh, I don't know. Anything. Anything that's important, I guess. Uh, it depends what's going on. That's a really, I don't even know how to answer that. Yeah, um, you've been, um, you, you've had first-hand experience uh, with the Silk Road trial. Um, Silk Road, we know, or, or most of us know what it is. It's an honest website that just provided a, um, provided a marketplace uh, for the free market without uh, infringement of the government uh, to, to take place. And uh, the, the government clamped down on it. Uh, it uh, it um, uh, arrested the founder and it started what I would call monster process that would be typical for the place where you and I were born in, uh, you know, behind the, the Iron Curtain. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how the process went? What were your findings um, and, and, and your feelings from the whole thing? Basically, um, Schumer, which is, you know, NYC's ruling hand uh, wanted, wants to crack down on cryptocurrency. So he was a huge, he was a huge push for this case ending up the way it has ended up. He hand selected the judge, her name's Forrest, and it went according to his plan. Uh, we now know that a lot of the things that occurred during the trial 
well, well, I knew this while I was there and a lot of the public didn't really get that information until now. A lot of the information was actually either redacted or not allowed to even be presented to the jury, uh, let alone talked about publicly. And now we find out that two federal agents were actually responsible for huge sums of uh, Bitcoin laundering between, you know, uh, Mt. Gox and into their own pockets. And one of them was responsible for having the, uh, co like, the conversation with the hitman. So we weren't allowed to know about this. And now we know about it, and we know that the judge knew about it, and we know that Schumer knew about it, and we know that the prosecution knew about it, and it was hidden from being part of the trial. How is that justice? How is that following any kind of uh, le le legal practice that's supposed to be, you know, the kind of the, the pinnacle of American justice and liberty? I mean, why do we have courts to make sure that, you know, uh, guilty people get punished and innocent people don't. Why do we have the system? The system is very easily played, and that was uh, that was what happened. Yeah, it was preposterous. I, um, so you're saying, and, and this is something that I haven't uh, so far um, considered. So you're saying uh, one of the main uh, main motivations behind the whole process was uh, the prosecutor's actual. Um, hatred towards uh, the cryptocurrencies in, in general? No, uh, Schumer wants to crack down in the state of New York, he wants to, and in the city especially, he wants to crack down on cryptocurrencies, and he wants to make sure that certain laws are, uh, you know, in place, and he has close ties with Lossky, who did the bit license, and it's all very, I mean, it's all very incestual, it's the same powers driving the same uh, oppressions over freedoms that is always, as it always has been, and it takes one guy who doesn't like Bitcoin to, you know, throw a guy in jail over it or to throw a couple of people in jail over it or to put forward a bill that's going to throw even more people in jail for it. So, I mean, for people to think that we're free in any sense, yeah, sure, a lot of us are free because we haven't freaking done anything to uh, feel the state's hand on, you know, uh, <laughs> any part of our bodies, uh, but the people that do do things often get thrown and locked away because, you know, they are watching. They are watching. They don't want us to transgress any of the plans that they have for how society should function and how much tax people should pay, etc. So, I mean, I was talking to one of, uh, I work at a, my parents and I own a restaurant, and I was talking to one of our regulars about it. And he was just interested. And I told him what happened in the trial. And he's like, that's not legal. That's no way that that's happened. Like, he, I had to convince him that this even occurred because he couldn't be, he couldn't fathom in his mind that's how crony the whole system was. Like, he literally, he's like, but that that's illegal. That's not, you can't just withhold evidence. I'm like, yeah, you can. The judge does whatever she wants because Schumer has told her exactly what to do. And she needs her career to go forward. Yeah, this was uh, so. This is the I think I, th I think this is the lowest level, the the, the district judge, which uh, is probably looking at you know moving upwards and, and using this as as a career, destroying young man's life over her um, career. I mean, th there were some moments that you and others reported, which were which were fascinating. Uh, Ross mother um, reported about this as well that. Uh, her, she, she basically changed her mind over a weekend that she she uh, agreed to allow a witness or or um, you know witness in on Friday, but you know then or Thursday I think was the last day of the trial. Uh, then came the weekend and uh, on Monday she came back and she said actually no this this will not be allowed. And my question is, who did she meet in those three days? Who gave her notes and instructions? And there were some other moments like. Andreas was not allowed as a witness because he's not a credible Bitcoin expert. I mean, Andreas, who else? Like, you know, list top three people in the world whom you consider Bitcoin experts. No one in his same mind would probably not include Andreas. Like, what the hell is going on here? Yeah, I, he was the first, you know, she asked me what my opinion on that was. I'm like, Andreas, get Andreas. He's well spoken and he can put it in layman's terms for the very dumbass jury. And he was he was denied. He was denied. And 
you know, if you were there, it was such, it was, it was ludicrous. So first of all, uh, the family had hired a private investigator from England to to hold their own uh, investigation uh, about the server, about everything that went on online, about the uh, hard drive, and all this stuff, right? And she wasn't allowed to say anything. She flew down there from England. They paid for her, all the stuff. She sat there, and she was like, she was instructed basically not to say anything. They literally introduced her, asked her like one question, and then she left. So obviously the judge, the restrictions the judge put on uh, the de this defense's witness was so uh, stringent that she literally couldn't say anything. Uh, and then, you know, Andrea's being denied and other witnesses being denied. And they had like, they had like two, three witnesses and they weren't allowed to say freaking anything. It was, it, it was an abhorrent, uh, you know, power grab by her. Yeah, it was it was sad. Uh, well, let's hope uh, new rounds of this trial will go will go better. Um, we'll see. Um, okay, let's move to something a little bit more cheerful. I I, I want to remind everyone if you wanna if you wanna ask some questions, uh, just uh, just type them below the video. Um, so I've seen you. Uh, you 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 attended some very interesting conferences and events uh, recently. Um, can you can you you know do you have any favorite moments? Do you have any favorite products? Any new trends that uh, that you are really hyped about uh, in in uh, in Bitcoin um, that you've uh, noticed recently um, at those events? Um, I have a favorite moment at one of the conferences. It was an Inside Bitcoin's conference in London, and um, there was a regulation panel that was saying things like the regulators are our friends you know they're just trying to help us they're doing a great job we should comply and be, you know this will help the community overall and um i had my extensions in and like long but blonde extensions in i had like a pink jumpsuit on i had pink heels on i had like my like gold uh, michael kors purse like i looked bimmed out it was really funny so um i get up i get the last i get the last question which was great I get up and everyone's like looking at me like, who is this? Like, why is she at a Bitcoin conference? Um, and then I say, uh, so let's imagine that ISIS begins to use Bitcoin and the government flips out and bans it outright. Are you guys going to follow the regulation and stop anything to do with Bitcoin? Nobody answered me. Um, I, the way I, uh, I precursored the question, I said, um, I know this is, um, I, I don't, what did I say? I, I know this is an unfair question, but I think it's reasonable in its unfairness. And the guy, the guy that answered me was, no, that's not a crazy question at all. I'm like, I didn't say it was crazy. So now he's already framing my question in an insane way. Like I'm some crazy person, right? Even though ISIS put out a document saying they are interested in using Bitcoin. So then all them pussyfoot around my question. Nobody answers me and they just kind of like, you know, dismiss it. After that, um, one of them starts harassing me on Twitter. I'm like, I'm here, man. Come talk to me to my face. Are you five? You wouldn't talk to me to my face. The other guys ignored me. And the youngest guy there came up to me and he says, thank you for asking that question. It's actually a really good question. And I'm sorry I couldn't answer you publicly because of my job. But yes, I would get out of Bitcoin if ISIS started using it and the government banned it. I'm like, thank you for your honesty. So that was my favorite yeah, moment. A, yeah, the difference of uh, you know someone dealing with you on you know Twitter or you know Reddit, which I know is your favorite platform, <laughs> and in person is sometimes uh, sometimes fascinating. Um, anything else? So, so this was London. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna mention companies I like, but we can do that later. <laughs> no, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, if you have something, uh, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, I, well, I thought you, yeah, you asked like, what, what tech am I excited about? I, I know, I kind of, there's a few things that I really like. I'm not sure, you know, of course, Dark Wallet is taking a while, but hopefully that comes out. 
zero cash taking a while again all the good things are kind of not happening yet so i just have to keep waiting uh but you know i think maybe that just means they're not rushing it and they're really working towards something that's going to be really good um other companies i i like i do like things that take you know expose regular people to bitcoin like not everyone falls in love with it and wants to like get to the nitty-gritty so I, I like purse i think that's cool uh purse.io you can like people can spend their amazon points to buy you stuff and they get paid in bitcoin for buying you stuff it's or you can buy stuff for people uh on amazon and they pay you in bitcoin and you get discounts so that's like that's cool uh i, I like i know i like change tip i mean it's off it's off blockchain but it's a it's a I've been writing about the tipping culture online like way before change tip was even a real thing. So that's like part of the reason I'm excited about it because I was like wanting that to exist. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll mention anything else that comes to mind as we talk. Yeah, the uh, microtransactions. I mean, um, this is something that uh, many of us expected and I've been talking about microtransactions uh, with Bitcoin. But the fact is that uh, the transaction fees, um, I mean, they are very small for your you know, day to day um, um, your transfers and purchases. Um, I mean, I, I, a few days ago, I transferred you a few hundred dollars uh, worth of Bitcoin from from Singapore to the US, uh, you know, in a minute. Uh, and it cost virtually nothing. But for for uh, the microtransactions, the fees um, are not insignificant. So off chain um processors like uh, change tape that facilitate that uh, seem like a great deal for for these kind of payments for you know articles or music or whatever um very small amounts where even that small fee um you know could, could be fairly at least psychologically significant portion um yeah, of well, that fee the thing the thing with um that too it exposes people to bitcoin really easily like i can change tip, you know, Pendulet, be like, hey, and then you click this link, you're like, oh, Bitcoin, oh, it's that easy. I mean, until you use it on some level, you won't really get how cool it is. So, I mean, at the very least, uh, the exposure is beneficial. Um, and maybe one out of a thousand of those people will realize the actual, more, the more grand implications of this technology, you know, not just for t tipping and having fun, it, you know, the this tech has some very interesting worldwide implications that can elevate ethics for everybody and can uh, de-elevate control. You mentioned Ben Gillard. Is he already into Bitcoin? I have no idea. I don't think so. <laughs> ben Gillard. If someone knows Ben Gillard, send this to him. Uh, this is 18th minute of the show. Send him straight to 18 minutes of, uh, of the show. And we encourage him to get into Bitcoin immediately. He don't, doesn't like the state, and Bitcoin is a great thing to fight the state. So uh, get get the message to him, whoever knows him. He would be a great I do know ally. someone who's working on it, so hopefully she's successful. <laughs> well, if it's she, she should be. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> okay, um, you you published a, a beautiful video yesterday or day before yesterday. Um, stages, um, I mean, it could be called stages of a Bitcoiner. Um, you went well. We all went through all of them, um, and uh, and you listed them in a very you know blunt way. And I'm sure many of us found ourselves in the process. Um, can you can you talk about it? Can you summarize it a little bit? Yeah, um, I if the video is called uh, Bitcoin is not a honey badger. So the honey badger meme is like the honey badger doesn't give a fuck and you can do anything to it. You know, Cobra bites it, like wakes up later. It it gives Bitcoin an impenetrable image of, you know, that it can't fail, that it can't be controlled, that it can't be censored, which is only half true. And I think it's important to face that hard truth. Uh, or it's a hate fact. <laughs> um, so I, I was starting to feel this way about eight months ago, and I wrote, I got very upset and angry about a couple of things in the space, and I just wrote the script, and I uh, it's been evolving 
and I just felt after the whole foundation and block stream fiasco on Reddit two days in a row, I was like, okay, it's time. So uh, it basically goes through the state. You know, I know a lot of people that feel like I do and they don't speak out and I don't speak out or they do. But amongst ourselves, you know, it's like who we talk to about it. Everyone wants to just like smell the daisies and like, you know, pump it up. But it's important to face truths as well. And I just go through the stages like, oh, Bitcoin, discover it. And then you're like, wow, you don't sleep because you keep reading about it. And then you're like, wow, it's going to change the world. And then you realize that that's going to take a lot of very hard work. Yeah. Right. And, uh, I mean, there's a lot of nuances in the video that you might not understand unless you're kind of, like, ancestrally deep into the community. Uh, so, I mean, don't feel, like, left out or bad. If you don't, it's probably for the best. But the main, the, the main point of the video is can we work really hard so that this technology doesn't just become absorbed by this machine of you know, the same? And uh, I don't want it to be part of the system. I don't want it to be just another cog and I don't want it to be uh, similar to this and similar to that and oh look it's another PayPal like no it's its own thing and it needs to provide uh, use cases that other things don't provide better already okay uh, we need to think about that it, there's a lot of things that Bitcoin isn't as good as doing as you know already existing tech does so we really need to not fool ourselves yeah, I'm putting the link to the video uh, in the chat if someone wants to watch it after the show and share it. It's great. Um, yeah, it's, it, I mean, it's kind of frustrating. I mean, yeah. Oh, and I fuck, fuck Libra tax. I'm pretty sure I met that guy at the, at the, so I'm just looking at the comment there. I'm pretty sure I met that guy doing a presentation in the London conference. Maybe it was a different tax. It was like, we must comply. And this is a tax service to incorporate Bitcoin into it. You know, let's just go out. And I told him as well, I have a video on my Facebook wall um, that I shot when I was, you know, challenging him and calling him basically like a sellout. And like, you're just banking on this new technology because you're a freaking bootlicker and you're just making a, you're just, you're just molding it back into the system that it's not even part of yet. People like that are the freaking problem. People like that who are uh, literally building things like, a tax system so that we can, you know, adhere to the laws that don't even exist for Bitcoin yet. Fuck that guy. Fucking asshole. And I said that to him, too. I mean, I'm not as crudely, but I was very, I don't know, I was mean. Yeah, I was uh, speaking about regulations at the um, Singapore Bitcoin conference, uh, and uh, I got a bunch of questions, and the last of them was exactly this. Uh, what about, you know, Bitcoin and, uh, and uh, avoidance in taxes? I'm like, look, if, if you impose unreasonable taxes, then people will look for ways how to how to avoid them. So scrap taxes altogether or at least minimize them so people feel they are reasonable. And then people will not bother finding ways how to avoid them. That's, I mean, that it's as simple as that. Yeah, th there's, there's dozens of studies that show that when you, the lower the taxes are, when, when you lower them, Actually, you collect more because people don't feel the need to evade them. They feel it's fair and they feel they're not being robbed and they actually pay their taxes willingly because it's easier to just pay that smaller amount than to go to an accountant and pay him $100 an hour to evade all the taxes. Um, yeah, it's, is it the left, left first curve, I think, the famous you know, curve that, you know, that there's a certain point where, you know, the, if the taxes are low enough, low enough then you maximize uh, the tax revenue uh, if they are higher then people start avoiding if they are lower then just because they're lower the revenue is uh, lower on the other hand um also i think milton friedman was was uh, exactly right on this if you if you lower taxes and your tax revenue increases you haven't lowered taxes enough um so um i mean there that's an aspect of yeah. it as well and you and I, being children of the Soviet Union, know this uh, from example because, like, okay, when I was a very little girl, I remember my dad talking. He he was the one of the first people after the collapse to have a small business in Russia, and he owned a meat processing plant and made like like sausages and stuff. And so he knew that we still have the Soviet mentality, we steal shit, okay? We're poor and we steal stuff because that's how you eat and survive and feed your family. 
So he'd give people jobs, and then he'd, at the end of every day, would give them, like, a couple of nice artisan sausages and meats to take home. Because he figured that if he gives some away, they'll steal less. Okay? <laughs> and I think he was right. Um, oh yeah, I, I lost you a little bit, but I think the audience uh, heard you, so I'll just follow up on that. Um, speaking of Russia, by the way, so Russia and Bitcoin, and you are you in touch? Uh, I guess I mean there there are people from the Russian community who are, um, or you know, who were born in in Russia or in former Soviet Union who are now in the West. But are you in touch in the actual Russian Bitcoin community? Do you know what's the situation over there? You know, with the and Ukrainian maybe as well with with the inflation and uh, and with sanctions and everything. How's Bitcoin doing in that that part of the world? Do you have any idea? Um, I'm not in touch specifically with anyone, but I know the community is like there. Um, one of my interviews was translated to Russian. There's like a Russian Bitcoin YouTube channel, so I know the community exists. Um, the thing like people, you know, it's illegal in Russia, right? Like they made it illegal, and it's kind of funny because it's like one of the first countries to do that, and. <laughs> People think that matters, but this is the difference between Russian people and the West, or like Canadians and Americans, okay, I'll, I'll stick to North America. Like, okay, it's illegal. You know how much stuff is illegal in Russia? You know, Putin passed the most laws in one year than any country has ever passed in the history of mankind, okay? Everything's fucking illegal in Russia. Guess what? We don't care. Russian people are all criminals because everything's illegal. Uh, we, we thrive on black markets. We come to America and we thrive on black markets. Uh, the most, uh, um, like, a lot of Bitcoin use is in North York in the Russian community in Toronto. Russian mobsters who launder their money using crypto uh, currencies or crypto valuta in Russian. So, like, Russian people don't care. The problem is Americans do care. And a little proposed bill panics everybody because nobody's going to touch the currency if it's like somewhat illegal now. This is why like I lose a lot of respect for, you know, <laughs> those guys. Like I so, like I hate Russian people, but like I love Russian people cuz they don't they don't care. They don't care and I love American people, but I hate them too cuz they're pussies in like a lot of ways. Like it's you know, I'm glad to be both. I think I have a good balance. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's very similar to where I, where I come from. I mean, it wasn't as brutal, but uh, still, uh, the the underlying culture is there. We we we've experienced the failure firsthand, the total failure. Like you know, many um, it's it's very difficult to speak uh, anarcho-capitalism to Germans because uh, to or even Singaporeans because the the government you know works reasonably well and just, they just don't see the the failure full blown so it, it's difficult for them for them to, to grasp it um but you said illegal does it mean really illegal like like you you can't own bitcoin and you can't transact bitcoin in russia because we've seen these reports all over the, the place that bitcoin has been banned in china and has been ban banned here and there and uh, it turns out later that actually you know, it has ended. What has been banned was maybe some particular form of, uh, you know, buying or, or, or entrance to the market or something. But it's not illegal to own Bitcoin. Uh, is that is this different in Russia? Is this that strong? You can't actually own Bitcoin in Russia. I I haven't seen any like headlines of them ever enforcing it, and I don't know how they would really like. Like my my opinion about the illegality of Bitcoin in Russia is that Putin doesn't give a crap. Like, yeah. he doesn't actually care. Um, and people are just, like, doing, like, I don't think it's being cracked down on. It's just, like, it's just, like, another law. Like, if they really want to, they'll single someone out just like America does. I don't know. Okay. Let's pick up another viewer's question. Is there a scenario involving perhaps Wall Street or government involvement where you would no longer be a Bitcoin maximalist? Uh, I'm going to give a short answer. Uh, no. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it to Julia to answer. Um, again, that depends on what point in time. I mean, I think that the tech is young. It's It can be molded to different people's interests. And, you know, uh, who knows where it's going to end up? Like, who knows 
who knows if uh, the mining pools are going to be controlled by a single entity in the next two years? Who knows? Uh, who knows if there's going to be so many whitelists that no one can, you know, the, the miners are going to be so much under the boot that they're going to have to comply with a lot of things. Like, I don't know. I don't I know where it's going. I think it could go either way. And I think being aware of all of the rec directions that it can go gives us a lot of strength, right? We can't be naive about it and you know, honey badger. Like, we have to um, we have to support projects that actually have its original ethos in mind, in my opinion, not project. I mean, the projects that, you know, reveal it to the mainstream are good, too. But the, you need to have both because what good is it for the mainstream if it just becomes like another freaking like an easier way of banking or another PayPal? Like who wants that? I mean, it could be that as well, but that shouldn't be what it's boiled down to. So it's, I don't know, I can't, I mean, sure, no, unless it, you know, becomes just like an efficient banking system that's controlled by the government and heavily enforced. I mean, why would I support that? Yeah, um, okay, so what, if, if we, if it uh, comes down to these extreme scenarios, then um, I, I agree with you, but uh, I think that the probability of that happening is, uh, is you know, negligible and, and, and lower every day just because of the, of the sheer um, networking power, um, or you know, the, the the computing power of the network and its, in its distribution, I very much like the article by by uh, um, was it uh, Cointelegraph or Cointelegraph quoting uh, John Matones about uh, um, about uh, cloud hashing and uh, how it actually helped the industry uh, to distribute the power and to strengthen the network and make it more resilient and all. All of these trends are showing um, that the, you know it's it's getting it's establishing itself more and more, and it's it's it would be more and more difficult or pretty much virtually impossible for anyone to to grasp control over it. Also, I okay to be more on the skeptical side, and I like your thoughts on this. Um, um, I like sort of Jim Jim Rogers' uh, view, for example, who respects the cryptocurrencies. He likes the idea. But he makes a very good point that governments uh, like their control of the money so much that they will find way how to make this impractical by regulations or taxes. I'm fairly optimistic. I think there uh, there will be many places where this will not happen. I think there might be places where where this will happen, where government where people will simply uh, follow these ridiculous regulations and will you know it, it will become impractical. But I still believe. Uh, there will be many places in the world where this will not happen just because governments will either not attempt or people will not respect it and will overcome all of these problems. What What do you think? Yeah, again, it could go either way. We've seen, you know, we've seen we've seen a 51 percent attack, uh, you know, months ago, and then you know the, the community pulled it pulled together and made sure you know it wasn't 51 percent again. Uh, there is. There does seem to be consensus towards, you know, decentralization overall, which is great. Um, but then you have, you know, you have these companies, you have 21 Inc. who got, what, $93 million of funding. What stops them from building, like, the biggest mining operation ever and taking over? Right? I mean, that Peter, Peter Thiel, uh, in his book, is quite a big fan of monopolies. And, you know, his definition of monopolies is quite loose. And he talks about how there's natural monopolies when you provide a niche a product that's the best. So if them building the biggest mining operation is a niche product that's the best, instead of, oh, no, actually, I just have way more access to money than anybody else, <laughs> I, then he's morally okay with that. I think the guy has a chip on his shoulder because he didn't invent Bitcoin. I mean... I mean, he's been quoted saying like he wanted PayPal to be like a like Bitcoin. Like he, the guy yeah, is messed up, yeah. man. He's convoluted and messed up. Yeah, you're 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 you sound a little little bit scary, but you make unfortunately too much sense. Um, okay, let's let's move on to something a bit more cheerful. Um, again, question from Ken: uh, Are either of you using Bitcoin daily, weekly, in a regular commerce like buying coffee, gas, office supplies, uh, and so on? I'm gonna start myself. Yes, there's a pretty healthy merchant network here in Singapore. 
Um, um, actually, we're meeting with uh, with a bunch of libertarians tonight, uh, including some people from Liberty.me in a place that accepts Bitcoin. Um, I'm paying for my air condition cleaning in Bitcoin. I'm paying for some online services and hardware um, with Bitcoin. Like, yeah, I try to use it um, every time I can, and I actually get to use it, uh, um, you know, a few times a week uh, easily. So, um, what about you? Well, how, how's the Toronto? By the way, Toronto is my, one of my favorite North American cities. I would love to see or know that the scene over there is 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 growing and thriving. It's okay. I mean. Toronto's a bit be like I don't know, I don't I don't like Toronto like in and of itself that much. I mean I know some Bitcoin people there. Uh, most of them have moved elsewhere. <laughs> like uh, so, I don't have any Bitcoin, so I can't comment on that. I don't. But you know, a friend of mine has Bitcoin, and I know that she uses it uh, for a lot of things like flights and um, buying spoons. And um, you know, tipping her friends and just transactions that are more simply done with Bitcoin than cash or credit card. Yeah, she loves it. So I get all I, you know, I live through her. Yeah, I also we, we get used to this, uh, and it, it's it's a fantastic scenario. Like you finish lunch and someone pays. Jeffrey wrote this in um, bit by bit, uh, his latest book, uh, which you can get if, if you join the me, you get it for free or you can you can buy it online. And he wrote exactly about this. Like you finish lunch and you know there's some change that needs to be um, exchanged, a couple of dollars and it just becomes complicated and all of a sudden, you know, there's Bitcoin. It's just so beautifully easy. You 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 know you, you get your phones together. The one can, time okay. The one time I did uh, use Bitcoin, which I don't have, uh, was at dinner with Jeffrey and a bunch of other people at the Chicago conference. And like nobody had like cash or like I just put everything on my visa and everyone, you know, gave me cash and Bitcoin and stuff. It was really easy. Yeah, that was probably the then, event he was writing about uh, in, in, uh, in his book. Um, go, go continue. Yeah, that's, I think, I think I, I think. I Thanks, Jeffrey. Love you too. <laughs> but then, since then, yeah. of course, my 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 phone. I lost my phone, and it didn't back up my phone wallet. So again, like, I don't have Bitcoin. I'm I'm a woman. I don't know how to uh I don't know how to save my private keys. I'm I'm too stupid. <laughs> oh, come on. Um, I know, I'm okay. Question here. Have either of you heard of OneBit, the service that uses MasterCard Pay terminals and BitPay in order to give people an option of using Bitcoin in a wider sense? If so, what are your thoughts? I read about it a couple of days ago. I haven't dug into it, to be honest. Uh, I don't know. Julia, have you? Um, I haven't heard of that one specifically, but um, I do know of a similar service that's coming out or is out. Um, I, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I don't know if they want it okay. too public yet. Okay. But yeah, there's a few, I think there's a few projects working on things like that. I mean, again, it's bringing it to the mainstream, which unfortunately, like, uh, I was talking to the CoinKai guys about this. They they gave me a terminal, and it's really cool. Like, the terminal is really awesome, but, you know, you can't use debit cards or credit cards with it. because And they didn't go that way because they want they don't want to collect private information of their users. So any company that is uh, incorporating debit cards and credit cards and, you know, a kind of interoperability with Bitcoin and those things, they're going to have to collect information in case they get a subpoena, et cetera. Which, you know, convenience equals the sacrifice of uh, privacy, ultimately, right? Yeah. Yeah, we'll see where it goes. Um, I mean, all these projects just sound uh, so so fantastic. That the sheer number of wallets that you can choose from uh, these days uh, is is amazing. Uh, and and this is the beauty of the unregulated free market. The moment that people don't need to um, ask for permission to to create something, they just go bananas and they create stuff. And every other day, you wake up and you find out what else has been. Um, you know, has been created or is being prepared, and it's just so exciting to 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 watch uh, every day. I mean, yeah. this is just one of those many things. It is. It's really cool. 
that's really cool. I mean, I always talk about the Soviet Union and how, you know, like we would have just all died without the black markets. That's where innovation happens. That's where human nature is at its uh, prime. So if people think that like this isn't happening, it's always been happening. It always will happen. So I mean, uh, and and being participating in this community and seeing how quickly people have created things for a tech that didn't even exist, you know, until very recently. Yeah, like it's cool to be human. Um, okay, let me pick up another question. Um, estimations from Federal Reserve and European Central Bank is about 100,000 users for Bitcoin. Uh, Jeffrey Robinson, who actually I don't know who that is, could someone comment on it, or maybe you know Julia, has said uh, 250,000. These are real people, not addresses. Uh, what are your thoughts and uh, projections? Um, I don't know, to be honest. Um, 100,000 globally sounds a bit too low. I would say it's probably more, but yeah, I have no idea. And to be honest, that's one of the beautiful things uh, about it, that we just don't know. We Because there's no way to know, because nobody collects and maintains this information. Nobody you know, can spy on us. Nobody can find out. Um, you know, if you want to have Bitcoin, you can do it without anyone, you know, having any clue that you've ever owned, uh, you know, and bought any Bitcoin, that you are hedging against the inflation that the government is, is um, you know, is, is forcing up on you. Um, and, and, and this is one of the wonderful things about Bitcoin. Um, so, I, I don't know, 100,000 sounds a bit low, maybe. I don't know. Julia? Um. I don't know. I, I should look into that. That'd be interesting. I guess the best way to estimate is probably to look at the exchanges that do gather information, like uh, Coin, uh, Coinbase and, you know, all the top exchanges. And I don't know if they reveal numbers specifically. I doubt they do. Uh, but I'm sure there is some sort of deduction that can be made from traffic volumes and then go from there. Yes, hundred. So uh, yeah, I just did a quick, quick math. A uh, hundred thousand is uh, uh, point oh one percent. So one in ten thousand people, less than or something more than one and a half uh, person in, in you know ten thousand uh, globally. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if if that's realistic, then it just shows you what space is out there to conquer. It, it also shows you, an, I mean, gives you an idea of uh, where the price uh, of Bitcoin, if that's what you're interested in, interested in, can be, uh, considering how many people use uh, allegedly Bitcoin today and how many more can, um, and if they try to, where, you know, where will, what will happen with, with the price. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the fact that we don't know and the fact that even if we have you know, a slightest clue how low it is and what is the potential of that uh, to grow. Blockstream, uh, you have any thoughts, Julia? Yeah, I mean, who was following the discussion on Reddit the other day between, you know, BTC Drag and Peter Todd and Maxwell, Gregory Maxwell? I want. I just want to know how informed people are. Well, um, I don't know. There's there's a lot of drama. Like people people raise some questions about about Blockstream, and uh, you know, Gregory has been accused of lying about a couple of things uh, having to do with his involvement in the company and like some other technical things. And I mean, this would take a very long time to go into. I mean, there's mailing lists of people calling him out and him saying, you know. Uh, also without him back. There, this is all, this is core dev drama, like mostly. Um, Blockstream hasn't actually done anything yet. They have a lot of funding. Uh, from the people that I know in the company and that I've personally met, I like them. Um, but I also trust the opinions of some of my closest allies in the industry. And there's also some objective facts that, you know, can't be denied about some of the things that some there have said so you know anytime you have a big well-funded company uh, working on you know innovation and then you have core devs working for that company you have to be critical and you have to 
you know, raise questions because this is what I'm talking about. Uh, money and uh, interest influencing the actual development of the technology, right? So if Blockstream wants to develop one type of technology and the protocol doesn't quite align itself with how they want to do it, well, they have a couple of core devs in the team. They could use their influence to change the core of Bitcoin to their needs. I'm not saying that they do that or that they will do that. Um, Gregory has come out and said he's put very like stringent uh, safeguards in place so those things don't happen. But when you make your own safeguards, like pretty easy to break them probably. Also, like <laughs> anyway, I don't know. I won't get I won't get too personal about it. There, I could talk about this for a long time. We'll see. We yeah, see. I agree. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I actually, um, I, I like the whole idea. I mean, we spoke about this uh, with uh, Jeffrey and Roger uh, in, in the first show and uh, the whole concept of, of side chains. It seems much more plausible than, uh, you know, than, than altcoins, which I'm fairly skeptical about. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see where it goes. It, it seems super, super interesting, super innovative. Um, and I don't know people involved personally. Um, um, so it's great to hear you uh, mentioning, uh, you know, some of them, um, and mentioning what uh, that that you know they seem like a good people and what they're what they are doing. So um, yeah, I'd, I'd I'd like to see those results. Yeah, well, um, we'll see. I mean, the side chains are interesting. A lot of people say they're not very different than altcoins. Uh, so I mean, like, it, there's you know, again, I I don't. I, they haven't done anything yet, so it's hard to be critical. But at the same time, you don't want to wait till they do something that's, you know, not, you know, uh, aligned with what I think is the Bitcoin ethos. You don't want to wait for that to happen before criticizing them. So, I mean, they should take it as a compliment of us, you know, waving a red flag because that means we consider them a powerful entity. They should take it as a compliment and they should participate in the conversation with the um, with the community if they care to, if they don't want to be accused of things, and they should clear things up in an honest way. That's, I mean, that's what, it is what it is. What do you expect when you get $21 million and you have, like, two core devs on your team? Like, what do you expect? Yeah. Um, question from J, uh, J Realm. What, uh, what are, okay, I'll, I'll probably have to fix the grammar here a little bit, what, what uh, is the most um, exciting thing you see in the Bitcoin um, over the next year or so? Um, Julia. Sorry, sorry, I was looking at the chat log. Yeah, what was the question? I was looking at the same. Um, for those who, who can <laughs> see it or will watch it on, on YouTube, I'm going to read it. Gavin has a facial hair now. Bitcoin price dropped too low. He can no longer afford Razor. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, so yeah, I'll repeat the question: What are what, what are you most excited about uh, in Bitcoin over the next uh, next year? For the price to go to a thousand, yay! Uh, <laughs> you don't want any Bitcoin. What would that be good for you? <laughs> I know. I just want the tech to succeed. You know. Um, okay, some of the things, I'm kind of involved in more artistic endeavors these days, um, so I'll keep you posted on that, um, uh, and mentioning art, um, my friend Max Field does really cool Bitcoin artwork, and they're called Kalarians, and they're like literally physical Bitcoins, like, they're really cool, you can go to, here, I'll, I'll post the website there. Um, so I'm trying to like, I, the, the, the freaking core dev drama and the Reddit and uh, all of these issues that have been bothering me for eight months, like they weigh me down and I mean, I, in, I think in the near future, I'm going to be strictly involved in the more artistic projects to do with Bitcoin and exploring it as a concept less than as a technology, uh, just because I'm on, you know, I'm an artist, my background's in art, so I figure, why aren't I participating on that side of things? Yeah, I and don't I, know I, if I that's a cop out or not. Sorry, go ahead. 
yeah, I don't know, like, uh, who knows? I kind of go with the tide, like, if something sparks my interest or enrages me, I'll, I'll participate, and, but, you know, I, I'm trying to kind of, like, relax a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing about, I mean, you, every, every other day, you know, you wake up and you find out what's going on, it's, it's so difficult to say what will we be most excited about in the next year. We have no idea because we have no idea what will be announced next week, let alone next year. Um, I can tell you what I'm most excited about uh, right now. Uh, I'm actually flying to Prague on on Tuesday, and Prague is uh, Prague in Czech Republic. Um, you know, being in a fairly small city, um, and you know, not like super wealthy or su super known for for you know having its own Silicon Valley or ton of capital um, venture capital money. Uh, there's just so much uh, stuff going on in Bitcoin, so much innovation. There's a single company there that does more innovation um, than you know Bitcoin industry in you know any like many other countries, uh, much bigger countries uh, combined. Um, I'm holding this uh, hardware wallet, for example. They they uh, are doing and you know they invented the, the pool mining, uh, but and then there's this space called Crypto Anarchy Institute, which uh, which is this big building with co-working space and cafe and makerspace and hackerspace, accepting only Bitcoin, nothing else. And and this big amazing community just living for for freedom and, and living for promoting Bitcoin. Um, and it, it seems fairly random, uh, given that Prague really isn't known as you know the technological center of the world or something. But it, there is a combination of that Eastern Europe, European hacking mentality that you mentioned at the beginning, that people just don't respect the, these arbitrary rule, rules and they find ways how to how to go around them. And uh, yeah, the result is fantastic. So anyone you know who who can who has a chance, uh, I encourage you, including you, Julia, to go to Prague to visit Crypto Anarchy Institute to visit the community. I'll be there, you know, most of the next month. So um, definitely, um, awesome. if, if you if you find a way, um, get over there. Um, another question from Eric: What do you think about the possibility of upcoming financial crisis, and how do you see it as impact impacting crypto? This is something I've been ranting about for a long time, uh, too long probably. But <laughs> Julia, go ahead. Do you think the the European kind of uh, more leaning crypto anarchist uh, communities are strong because Europe has hit such a low and America's still kind of keeping themselves up? I mean, dude, if you want Bitcoin to go to ten thousand, you have all the freaking banks collapse, have a have another financial crisis. That's when Bitcoin's going to succeed. Like, I'm not the first one to say that. So, I welcome it. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, the first bubble of 2013 was caused by Cyprus. Just people all of a sudden woke up and find out, found out they can't get their money from the bank account. I mean, it, it, it's supposed to be their money, um, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they can't get access to it. They they just firsthand experienced what is fractional reserve banking. That you know, your money in the bank is not your money. You know, the moment you hand it over to the bank, that money goes away, and it's not yours anymore. You have just you know, some uh, the bank has some sort of ob obligation, which in fact, by the law, is not really an obligation. Um, and and you know, their state insurance, w which doesn't have enough money in it, and so on and so forth. So we uh, people, you know, firsthand experience all these examples how the system is slowly failing. And I totally agree that such event, Cyprus is tiny. It's a you know, it's it's a tiny place in the middle of nowhere. Imagine something like that happening in Spain. Imagine uh, there's a new service in Spain. You can withdraw fiat, I mean cash, from from uh, from uh, ATMs by Bitcoin. Now imagine the super uh, well, from our point of view, super optimistic scenario when all of a sudden people wake up and they can't withdraw money from their bank account, and some Bitcoiner comes to the ATM, you know, sends Bitcoin to the ATM and it gives him cash. Imagine that PR potential for Bitcoin. I mean, this this would you know, we we call it to the moon. Uh, this would be such an event. Well, um, people realize that they actually aren't free, and that the government can do whatever they want. Um, they'll use things that are a little bit better. Um, so a friend, 
friend of mine here objects that it wasn't caused by Cyprus, but it was correlated in time. Um, I wonder why do you think that? I, I think, I mean, it wasn't just the correlation. I agree that hardly ever anyone in Cyprus heard about Bitcoin, but the effect that people globally, not only in Cyprus, that they realize that, you know, they can wake up one day and can't get access to their money. And they heard that this Bitcoin thing cannot be blocked in the same way. I think there was. Um, Anyway, um, so yeah, I, I think this would be this would be um, in a way great event. We of course, I mean, not that we want that to happen, but uh, we know it's going to happen. I want it to, we know it. I want it to happen sooner the better. Why are we like, <laughs> rip the band? Yeah, exactly, off? because it, it needs to happen, and the, the, the more it is prolonged, the worse the consequences be. So we'd rather for it to happen tomorrow because then that will minimize the consequences. Um, I'd rather and, uh, it would... my children. Like, hello, but no one's having children anymore, right? No one cares. Oh. <laughs> that's why. Um, that's, that's one of the problems. <laughs> no one want. No yes. one wants to work in this world because they're not leaving an imprint of their genetic material behind. So why do they care? They're gonna die. People have kids, <laughs> please. <laughs> Um, okay, I'll, I'll throw this question and I'll, I'll leave it up to you whether you will answer or not. Who is the most annoying person in cryptocurrency? The most annoying? Oh my god, there's so many! We <laughs> <laughs> have an answer, but I will not throw this person under the bus because they are already under the bus and I don't want to add to it. Okay. I'll drop okay. it. <laughs> Um, okay, we have like four minutes, three minutes. Uh, what happens to Bitcoin mining when we get close to 21 million Bitcoins mined? Are you okay with the amount of energy used on Bitcoin mining currently by Sean? That's like two different questions. Well, when we, when we mine it out, it will just be transaction fees. The transaction fees will have to go off for the mining incentives to continue. Okay. Um, and uh, what was the second part? Oh, the energy. I'm not an environmentalist. I don't care. I mean, well, like humans will find a way. I mean, if we're, uh, we'll find a way. It, it, I'm not that concerned about it. Um, the only concern is the incentive again. So uh, when it gets so costly, you, you know, again, you get pooling of powers that can afford to actually keep mining. Um, that sure, that's a problem. But I think he's more talking about from like an environmentalist point. Of view. I don't have. Yeah, the, so for the first question, actually, I, I don't think uh, that uh, transaction fees will necessarily uh, need to go up because, uh, I mean, presumably the value of uh, Bitcoin or the, you know, the price of Bitcoin in fiat or, you know, it's value compared to real goods uh, should continue to go up. So even if transaction fees remain flat, um, they, uh, they should go up compared to the costs of uh, you know the, the expenditures for mining so um i don't think it's necessarily for for those things to go up but to right. go up and as for the when if they do go up used, a little bit like yeah i agree with you but i was just saying even if they do go up like big deal it's still going to be better than everything else yeah and we'll still have these off-chain solutions that will you know allow us to to do the microtransactions i'm not worried about that and the same for the energy energy usage i mean if you're worried about energy usage um, you know here in singapore just if you you know people when they commute in the morning they play games on their phones you know which has some some um, uh, energy expenditures uh, and I mean, if you're worried about that, then you can see what would be considered a waste of energy. You know, people, instead of playing games, they could educate themselves or something. Um, what, I mean, yeah, I, I, I couldn't care less. I mean, the, the world from the environment point of view is, is getting better and better by the day. Anyway, I don't think Bitcoin will, you know, change this or reverse this uh, even slightly. You know what's gonna happen? Some guy in like a Chinese like uh, uh, operate operation, like an illegal Chinese mining operation, will be like, "Damn, like we're using a lot of energy and it's costing us, and like the governments could track us down by how much energy we use. 
I'm going to invent a new source of energy that's clean and easy to uh, convert. And this like Chinese guy will do it because of the uh, financial incentive and the whole world will benefit. That's my theory. That's how innovation happens. Um, okay, I'm going to ask the last question before we go. What is go Ghost Outside the Machine? And I'm, I'm uh, placing the link uh, to the chat for people to, to know what I'm talking about. So what, what, what is that phrase? Can you, can you explain that before we go? Well, it's like an old school like philosophical concept. Uh, I mean, Hume covers it. There's also a really cool anime called uh, Ghost Inside the Machine, and it's about uh, advanced robots, but they're still humans because they have a soul, and it plays with the idea of at what, like, at what point are you a machine, at what point are you human, and how can you differentiate between the two when we haven't even defined what being a human being is. So why am I less human than you just because you're flesh and I'm not? There's a lot of like, there's a lot of iconography and old concepts that go with it. So I kind of took that and boiled it down to. You know, the machine being our current systems, our, you know, mechanical um, environments that we are forced to live inside of. So that's our body, right? So what what's our ghost? What's our soul? So could Bitcoin be something outside of that? Can I don't want Bitcoin to be inside the machine. I want it to be the ghost, like the soul outside the machine. I want it to live on its own a platform. And um, yeah, I mean... It's incredibly wishful thinking, but I think if it happens with anything, it's going to be with Bitcoin, at least in my lifetime. Yeah, well, I hope. Um, anyway, check out that link. Um, it's a beautiful product, a beautiful T-shirt. And if you want to support Julia and what uh, she's doing, it's a great way to support her financially and, and get something for it. Uh, uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, Please uh, check out um, bitcoinnotbombs.com uh, for the for the contest for the best anti-war uh, meme that I mentioned. Uh, check out uh, Julia's page, bravetheworld.com, and her and her YouTube channel, and check out liberty.me and sign up uh, to meet other other bitcoiners, other libertarians, uh, and you know. Be, uh, be on this island of positive deviation. Uh, and thank you, Julia, for coming. Thanks for having me, Thomas. It was really nice to meet you. Bye-bye.